Good morning and praise the Lord. Good morning. Uh, we thank God for the opportunity for us to be here today. I was uh, challenged by the faithfulness that some of us here have uh, displayed because I stumbled across a directory of 1993 and I was looking at the names of people that have not given up, people that have served God even when I didn't know the direction my life would take. And I would see some names that are still here. The Gawits are still here. Uh, the Bastins. In fact, I met John Bastin out there and I was asking him, I'm surprised. 1993, you're here. He told me they were wedded here uh, in 1975. I could see the name of Dan Dalton, Joyce Burr, uh, even online, Gary and uh, Barbara Harmon. I would see Jean. I would see Dave Freeland and Linda, I would see Amanda's name and quite a number of you here. And I was still late when I looked at this and I said, there's a time when uh, we normally start to do something and then we give up on the way, either because the journey becomes so tough or sometimes we have opposition, sometimes we are discouraged. And sometimes other things come on the way. And that inspired my sermon today of rebuilding the walls um, that we see in the book of Nehemiah. If you have your Bibles with you, please could you turn with me to the book of Nehemiah chapter 4. In fact, I was almost tempted to change the title of my sermon from Rebuilding the Broken Walls to don't give up. You see, um, this uh, person called Nehemiah was an ordinary person, but he was a man with a mission, a mission to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. You see, Nehemiah, the Bible says, is one of the most effective team builders that we see. He understood the importance of working together. He understood that when faced with a challenge or a problem, you do not need to go through it alone. You need the support of other people. Nehemiah was a cupbearer uh, of the king of Persia, which meant that in modern day, he would be somebody like um, a security guard or a butler. He, his job was to protect the king because the cupbearer's work was to protect king's food and drink from being poisoned. And so if there was someone to die, if the king was being poisoned, it was Nehemiah. He could actually taste the king's food before the king ate the food. So being a cupbearer meant that he was uh, trusted or among the most trusted people in the land. The story of Nehemiah opens up in chapter 1. And uh, we meet Nehemiah's brother having traveled from Jerusalem to Persia where Nehemiah was to visit him. And in the course of their conversation... Nehemiah asked him about the condition of Jerusalem and how people were doing. And his brothers told him, the people that are back in Jerusalem are living in disgrace and shame. Why? Because the walls were broken down. And in ancient times, when a city's wall were broken down or were lying in ruins, it was are uh, actually a state of deep trouble. When the walls were down, thieves and bandits from outside the city could invade the city. So there was no protection. There was no pride. When a city's wall were down, then the city was vulnerable to every 
um, conceivable kind of evil because walls help to protect people and their household as well as their blessings. And so walls provide a security for the people living in their cities. They served as a shield. And so a city that was without walls was exposed to attack. Broken walls makes a, made a city just to be a, that vulnerable. And even in our lives, broken walls of family, broken walls of a church, broken walls of a city makes us vulnerable to the enemy. Remember the Bible says, the thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And so Nehemiah knew that something had to be done. And he made a very courageous decision. He went to the king and asked for three things. One, leave of absence. Two, he also asked for a military escort. And also he asked for some resources like timber from the king's forest. You see, this was a huge risk. But the gracious hand of God was over his life. And when the people of Jerusalem heard of Nehemiah's story and recognized that God, uh, God's hand was in him, they said, let us begin rebuilding the wall. So they started this good work. And when they started the work, everybody was enthusiastic. Everybody was happy. They had a heart rate. Everything was great. But when they reached halfway point of the project, they got discouraged. The project seemed too big. It was hard. It was difficult. And then that's, that's when now we come to chapter 4. We are in rebuilding our walls. In doing the Lord's project. Normally we begin with enthusiasm. Normally we begin with our heart rate. But sometimes halfway down the line, people give up. And so how do we rebuild the walls without giving up in life? From chapter 4, verse 1 to 23, I would like us to reflect on some things that helped Nehemiah to stay on course and finish the work that he had been given. Number one, he recognized the danger and opposition. He did not wish it away. You know, anyone who desired to do a great thing in life, in church, for God, will face opposition. The devil isn't very keen on half-hearted people who are not sold out for God. No. But whenever you start on fire for something, the amount of opposition that you will receive will confirm to you that that is something that the enemy does not want. And so in Nehemiah's case, in verse 1 to verse 3, the Bible says, When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became very angry and greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they sac offer sacrifices? Will they finish it in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Verse 3, the Bible says, Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they are building, even a fox climbing upon it, would break down their walls of stones. You see, the strategy of the enemy, number one, is criticism, mockery, and uh, being sarcastic. The enemy belittled their abilities. What are these feeble Jews doing? The enemy challenged their ambitions. Will they restore the wall? Are they going to make it? And, and I'm mentioning this because there is some of the things or the tools or the strategies that maybe the enemy has used in the past to attack you, to attack me, so that we don't continue with the work of God. Belittling our abilities. I cannot do it. It's for somebody else. He challenged their ambitions. Will they restore the walls? He mocked their optimism 
Will they offer sacrifices? Do they think it can be done? The enemy attacked their enthusiasm. Will they finish in a day? Because they need it. In, 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 verse, in chapter 2, verse 20, Nehemiah had said that we believe the God of heaven will give us success. So they were looking towards success. But the enemy is attacking their enthusiasm, telling them, no, this is just a hot feeling. Can you finish in a day? And the enemy undermined their confidence. Can they bring stones back to life? In many of the times, we give up or we stop rebuilding our lives because the enemy has come to belittle our abilities, to challenge our ambitions, to mock our optimism, to attack our enthusiasm for the work of God, to undermine our confidence. Not only were they fighting things like uh, criticism, but another thing was conspiracy. There were threats and intimidation. If anger and ridicule that they had employed didn't work, the enemy got more aggressive. You see, Nehemiah's enemies had to be careful because he had the permission from the king. And so they could not openly attack him. They could not rally their troops and march to Jerusalem or they would, they would be charged with the rebellion against the king. But they could use, still use threats of violence verse 8 and verse 11 which they circulated among the Jews living near them look at uh, verse 8 they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and start trouble against it verse 11 and also our enemies said because they before they know it or see us we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to their work. You see, still small bands of terrorists could sneak in and pick off a few of the people working on the wall. And maybe Sanballat and Tobiah would just tell the king, well, this was just a renegade um, that di we didn't have control over. You see, Satan also uses subtle or overt threats and intimidation to get us not to do the work. Threats and conspiracy. And then thirdly, another uh, strategy that the enemy was using was discouragement. The people were being discouraged. It's one thing when the enemy attacks your work, but it's another when the attack rises from within. So instead of uh, Jeremiah, I mean Nehemiah getting attacks from outside even amongst the people themselves there was discouragement they were fatigued verse 10 the strength of the laborers were failing and the people were tired they were on the verge of burnout and breakdown they say that they say that in most of the churches 80% of the work is done by 20% of the congregation. So you find if you have 100 people in a church, only 20% of those people are always doing something for the Lord. The 80% are spectators. So you find people getting tired because when you look for a volunteer to do something, it will be the same person. When you look for somebody to handle another activity, you just have the same person doing that because only 20% are active. The rest are, well, we are God's people going to heaven. So people were, could be tired. There would be burnout. There would be frustration because they, they, in verse 10, the Bible says there was so much rubble. It's everywhere. You can't rebuild on top of a rubble. It will unsteady the building. You have to remove it and so the task seemed to be overwhelming. There was also fear in verse 12. The Jews came, the Bible records, 10 times. We can't do it, they're telling Nehemiah. We can't do it. Somebody said fear is false evidence appearing real. They had bought the threat of the enemy. And they believed the word of the enemy. Probably Sambalat and Tobiah and Geshem and the, other, the Arabs, they're right. 
We can do it. Nehemiah, I think we are just too of ambitious. They also lost focus. The focus was on the wrong place because they were listening to the wrong people. Verse 10 and verse 12. They were focusing on the enemy. The rubble never bothered them before until the enemy pointed it out to them. They were not complaining about the rubble when they started the work. It had been there. But when the enemy pointed it to them, they started thinking about it. So they focused so much on the mountain of impossibility than what could be done. You see, your efforts and motives will be brought into question and everything you do can be scrutinized when the enemy points into it. But you have to remember this morning that your duty is not to please your critics or the complainers. And your duty is to please the Lord. Somebody said, and I quote, that have an advice for the complainers in the church. The man who says that it can't be done should never interrupt the man that is actually doing it. So the first thing is, Nehemiah recognized the dangers. We have to know our enemy. The Bible says, for the enemy we fight is not flesh and blood, but spiritual forces. But another thing is that Nehemiah relied on God. And in rebuilding our walls, we need to rely on God. When the enemies attacked Nehemiah and his men did the right thing, they focused on God and not the enemy. Trust God for who he is. In verse 4, Nehemiah goes to God in prayer. Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back to their own heads. Give them over as a plunder in the land of captivity. He goes to God in prayer. He was looking up. They turned to God in faith. They exercised the privilege that they could tell it to God. You know, in verse 4 and 5, the leaders prayed. Both Nehemiah called on God. He went to the Lord looking for help and direction. You see, he was not turning to man-made organizations for his help. A lot of people, when they have a challenge, even in church, we turn to madmen organizations. We turn to books that are telling us 10 ways of doing this, 10 ways of being happy. And, and, and so we don't turn to God. We belittle God. And, and the enemy knows how to um, be very sarcastic about God. And some of them are very hilarious and looks like uh, just good drama. I was just watching some of the TV shows now that. Um, I, I'm here, I, I, I watched what had been um, trending sometimes, and I came across some very uh, nice TV show that used to air, I think either in the 90s or 80s, or The Church Lady. How many of you watched The Church Lady? Church Lady? Oh, that's an interview. And they make it feel so nice in terms of making fun, but they simply ridiculing Christianity and making Christianity looks like a joke so that you're not taken seriously. But the leaders went and prayed. They had to look to God because he had been guiding his people through the treacherous waters for thousands of years. He had helped others and yet Nehemiah knew that God will help him. So the leaders prayed and the laborers also prayed. In verse 9, uh, the Bible says, But we prayed to our God and posted a guard at, and, uh, at God day and night to meet this threat. So it wasn't just the leaders that were praying to God. Everyone involved in the work, they bathed the work in prayer. They all turned to the Lord in dependence upon him and believed him for the help that they needed. You see, the best thing that we can do as a church is to come together in a spirit of united, focused prayer. Because we need the Lord these days. If we call upon him, he will hear us and he will show us great and unsearchable things that we do not know. 
They were told not to fear the enemy, but to focus on the Lord. So Nehemiah, in rebuilding the broken wall, he relied on God. And in order for us to do the work that God has given us, other than just recognizing that the dangers would come, you don't have to look for trouble. Trouble will look for you. You have to rely on God. Number three, these people responded to the duties assigned to them. They actually did the work. They worked with genuine commitment to the tax in verse 6. The people, the Bible says in verse 6, So we rebuilt the wall till all of it had reached half of its height, for the people worked with all their heart. These people, they gave themselves and said, We are going to work for God. We are going to rebuild. Even when their enemies knew that God, even the enemies knew that God had accomplished great work in them. They didn't just pray about the work. They didn't just think about it. No. They were praying and prayer was the beginning. They were also working. After prayer, it was time to bend the back under the load and carry the work. And you know, they were united in the process of that work. They were carrying the burdens of each other. The Bible says, as you look at verse 6, uh, the, uh, um, Nehemiah records, so we, it's not they, it's not others, it's not someone else, no. They were united in the process of their work. The Bible says they had a mind, people had a mind, or they worked with all their hearts. This expresses unity of purpose and work. And they were working together, and as a result, the work was accomplished. They were also united in the protection of their work. While they all worked, they also watched. Everyone had others' best interests at heart. For them, the big picture was the main focus. They were not gossiping and talking about each other. Each member was keeping eyes open for the slightest hint of trouble. Where can we, how can we support the weak? Maybe in, if in a church we may think about how do we uh, support each other. If somebody has not been in the service for two Sundays, maybe three Sundays, what's happening with them? You see, if each person is watching the enemy, he will have a more difficult time getting his foot in the door. And the strongest walls are useless if the gates are weak or if the gatekeepers are careless or disloyal. I think the church today, not First Baptist Church, but the church of Christ today, we need gatekeepers that are loyal and strong in prayer. They were also united in the progress of their work. They were together in it as it was moving. Each person had a different function, but they were all united. This is the essential, this is essential to the success of their work. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider one another to provoke and to love and to good works. They were united with God's people. Don't get so far away from God's people that we are no longer working together. We need each other. The leaders were side by side. Finally, the way that I also see Nehemiah rebuilding the walls and finishing the work without giving up is they chose their battles wisely. They didn't just fight any battle. No. They needed to remember what they were fighting for. And we also need to know what we are fighting. We are not fighting any battle that comes our way. And so, what are these things that Nehemiah reminded them 
when he was calling them for battle when the enemy was striking he reminded them that you're fighting for your family you're fighting for the future of Jerusalem you're fighting for your God there I see three things one they remembered that their faith was worth fighting for they were fighting for their faith more was at stake in Jerusalem than than a wall. Nehemiah knew that the very worship of Jehovah, the very worship of God, is in the balance. Because if they cannot worship God in His temple, I mean, then we are not going to worship God. So he's reminding them: remember that your work is because of your faith. So as you fight, your faith is worth fighting for. Remember, as we pray and as we labor for this church, the future of our church depends on what we do now. What we do now will determine the atmosphere of worship in this church for a long time to come. And that is why I thank God for those that have been here long enough for this time because you made some right decision those years, those 80s and those 70s and those 90s when some of us did not even imagine we'll be here. But you made those decisions that here today we can worship God. May God bless you for that. But be careful that you don't allow the enemy to empty your altars, to silence your praise, to extinguish your testimonies. They knew that the faith is worth fighting for. Number two, they also realized that the families are worth fighting for. Nehemiah positioned them by the families because he knew that if the enemy is struck and your wife and your children are close to you, you are going to fight to death because you are pro protecting your family. And so he knew the struggle was for the very lives of their family. If they succeeded, their families would leave. If we succeed in building our church, in, in rebuilding the walls and working for God, years to come, our grandchildren will still uphold this church. Let's not be sold to the idea that the church will die because this is the Lord's church. They were fighting to maintain a place of worship that, impact, that will impact their families. And they also fought for their future. The future of Jerusalem and the Jewish faith was on the line during this time of conflict. These people were battling, not just for themselves, but for the needs that were currently at hand, but they were also battling and fighting for the next generation and the future generations to come. No one knew that future, but they knew that their fu that future rested on what they did right then. You see, None of us knows the future, what the whole future holds for this church. However, it is certain that our future, bright or dim, rests on the decisions that we make at this time. Friends, if you know Christ and try to accomplish anything for him, you will experience opposition. Respond as Nehemiah did with the prayer keeping on the work, vigilance against the enemy, and keeping your focus on the great and awesome God whom we serve. Spiritual work requires spiritual wisdom. Is there a desire in your heart to see that the Lord takes this church and prepare it so that its future is far brighter than it is in the past? Then we must come together before him, seek his blessing, his wisdom, his power for the task that lies ahead of us. I am here to encourage us that we do not give up. It is a good thing that we start what we finish. And I believe we can finish well. You may have made mistakes in your life. In your own spiritual world. Maybe some gates in your life are burnt down. And you feel like you are exposed. You may have regrets. But thank God that we can push past every discouragement. Every situation around us. And move forward. And rebuild our broken lives. You see. 
we serve a God who is able to pick all broken pieces together and make them into the whole. Maybe as we see in the Nehemiah, the walls were physical walls. There are people that today, the walls that they need to build are their spiritual walls. Because you are exposed to the enemy attack. May God help us to rely on God. May God help us to do the work and fight for the right things. Amen.